Yeah, we're up to Jeremiah chapter 22, and uh, look at verse number 3. begins by saying, Thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness. The title for the sermon this morning is Execute Judgment and Righteousness. Okay. Now this psalm, uh, sorry, this chapter, what I want to sort of focus on today is looking at our lineage, looking at our house, that could be our family, or, you know, the church is also known as the house of God, and seeing how we can ensure that we continue a godly or a very righteous lineage. Uh, what we see during this chapter is God is basically saying, look, there's going to be an end to your house. He's speaking to the king here, and he's saying, look, there's going to be an end to your house because, as we know, his judgment's going to fall, and they're going to be taken into captivity. But this is not just a chapter directed to uh, the kings. This is, this is a chapter directed to anybody that's on the earth. You know, anybody in authority, anybody that has a family, any single, a, any individual person, this is directed to, and I'll go and show you that soon, why that's the case. But let's pick it up there in verse number 1, Jeremiah 22, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Go down to the house of the king of Judah, and speak there uh, this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sittest upon the throne of David, thou and thy servants, and thy people that enter by these gates. And so this is not just uh, to the king, but it's also to the king's servants. And then it says anybody that enters the gates of Jerusalem. So it's, it's for everybody, okay? But it is being directed toward the king. Now, if you were here for the sermon on Thursday, or you listened in on uh, Jeremiah 21, who was the king that approached Jeremiah asking for a message? Does anybody remember? Yes, Zedekiah, King Zedekiah. Now, this is not, he's not speaking to King Zedekiah here. He's actually speaking to one of the kings that are the predecessors. One thing you'll notice, uh, and it's something that I've not really covered uh, until this point, is the book of Jeremiah is not in chronological order. Okay? Now, generally speaking, it is. You know, chapter 1 is about Jeremiah being called into the ministry as a, as a prophet. You know, the last chapter, chapter 52, is the Babylonians coming in and destroying, uh, you know, the city of Jerusalem. So, you know, in a general sense, it is in chronological order, but uh, the chapters themselves are not always in that same order. So you, you could be mistaken of thinking this is about King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah is not even in the picture just yet, okay? So we're actually going back in time. And uh, let me just uh, explain this to you. So if you drop down to verse number 18... In the same chapter, verse number 18, it says, uh, if, you keep, if you look at it, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. So the, the king that Jeremiah is going to preach toward is Jehoiakim. Now you may remember on Thursday I mentioned there was the, the last three kings of, of Judah was Jehoiakim, then his son Jehoiakim, and then Zedekiah. So chapter 21 was Je Zedekiah's in power, but now we're going back to kings, to King Jehoiakim. Now, if you drop down to verse number 29, let me just show you that this is not just a message to the kings. This is not just a message to Judah, because in verse number 29 it says, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And verse number 2 said, and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah. But then verse number 29 saying, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And so while this message is being, like I said, uh, told to the king, to King uh, Jehoiakim, it is actually to all the inhabitants that are on the earth. So we better pay attention. Don't forget Jeremiah is the prophet to the nations. Okay? He's preaching to everybody, every nation. So this is relevant to us again in 2021 in Australia. Look at verse number 3. It says, Thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness. And this is where we get the title for the sermon this morning. Okay? This is the instruction given to Jehoiakim. There's still time for them to save the nation. There's still time for God to withhold the coming judgment of the Babylonians at this point in time. Okay? Because we've gone back in time. Okay? In, in uh, Jeremiah 21, the Babylonians are already there. Okay? But we're going back in time here. Okay? And so God is saying, look, execute ye judgment and righteousness. Okay? Now, what is judgment? You know, how often do people say to Christians, you shouldn't judge? But the Bible's constantly telling us, execute judgment. Okay, and again, this is not just to the kings, this is for us. Okay, what is judgment? It is the act of judging. It is to know what is right and wrong. You see a situation and you pass correct judgment, that is correct, that is righteous, or this is wrong. You know, this is something we shouldn't do. Okay, execute judgment and righteousness. What's righteousness? Righteousness is the state of of being righteous. 
which means you act upon that which is right. So you're confronted with some options or situation, you need to pass judgment, do I do this or do I not do this? And then you choose the way of righteousness, I'll do what is right. So it's not just judgment, but it's doing or carrying out the act of righteousness. This is what's going to preserve your lineage. This is what's going to preserve your house. This is what's going to guarantee that your family continue on serving the Lord, being a righteous, godly uh, family. Or this is also going to guarantee that Blessed Hope Baptist Church continues to be a godly church if we execute judgment and righteousness. Okay? You'll soon see this is what guarantees a long lineage, a godly lineage. And then it gives us some examples of how to be righteous and, and, and pass judgment. Now, let me just quickly say, you know, in the New Testament, this is the same concept of, you know, don't be a hearer only of the word, but a doer. Okay, so we hear God's word that helps us with our judgment passing, but it's, it's no point. It's, there's, there's no point of just being able to judge correctly. It, it's then taking the act. It's doing the work that is really the, 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 uh, the fulfillment of having the right judgment. You know, there's a lot of Christians that know how to judge correctly. They know what is right and wrong. But then they don't personally act out that which is righteous. Okay? And then you'll, you'll find that your family lineage will stop. You'll find that your church is no longer on fire for the Lord because we stopped doing these two things. Now, some examples in verse number 3. It says to deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. So, as, 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 you know, the government should be stopping people from oppressing one another. Here's the problem though, our governments become the oppressor. <laughs> They're meant to be stopping the oppressor, they've actually become the oppressor. But the lesson we get out of this, we obviously can't pass judgment in the same way as governing authorities, but we should re re refrain from, being, from oppressing other people. You know, from forcing. You know, I, I, I'm a pastor, I never force you to do anything. I come here, I, I preach God's word, I preach the importance of being in church, I preach the importance of reading your Bible, I, I read how you ought to live your life, but I don't, I don't come to your house and force you. You know, I, I leave it in your hands. You know, I realize we're all at a different journey. We're, we're, we're all growing in the Lord and we're not all at the same place. And you know, sometimes when I preach, there are some parts of the sermon that are relevant to some person, and other parts of the sermon that are relevant to other people. I'm not the judge of that. You know, I'm just here to preach God's word. And then I, I hope and I expect that you guys would listen and then act upon the righteousness. You know, do what is right. But I can't force you to do that. I'm not a, an oppressor. You know, I'm not here begging you to give your finances to the church. I hope you do it because it's important for the, for the work of God, for the house of God. But I'm not here to force your hand. Okay, I'm not here to be an oppressor. What else is another example? And do no wrong. Well, this makes sense. If we're to act in righteousness, well, we are to not do wrong. Do no violence to the stranger. Hey, we're called not to be violent people. Hey, we're called to be hospitable to strangers. And so, you know, one example that we might have is, you know, we might have a visitor turn up to the church one day. Okay, well, we ought to be hospitable, right, to that person. Welcome them, make them feel that they're welcome to the house of the Lord and, you know, you know, bring them in, no matter how different they may appear on the outside. The fatherless, nor the widow, we should look up, you know, we should be hospitable to those that are fatherless, those that are widows. Neither shed innocent blood in this place. Well, this is obvious. Don't be a murderer. Hey, but these are things that the kings ought to be forcing, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, 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 Judging in their nation, okay, making sure that murderers are put to death, making sure that, you know, the killing of innocents is judged correctly, all right? So we see those examples there. Now let's keep going go to verse number four. And if you do this thing indeed, what thing? Well, to execute judgment and righteousness, right? If you do this thing indeed, look at this, then shall they enter in by the gates of this house kings, sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, he and his servants and his people. So there's a promise here. If we are a people, or if the king here acted upon judgment and righteousness, the guarantee is they will continue in the kingdom. They will continue having kings. You know, not just have a kingdom, but a kingdom that is very prosperous. They're riding in chariots and horses. It's not just the, the government or the kings that are being prosperous, but also the servants and his people. They're all re, re, uh, rejoicing in the blessings, in the benefits of this nation that carries, that continues to serve God, that continues to execute uh, judgment and righteousness. So again, this is a message for us. If you want your house to continue, you want your children to continue being in church, loving God, loving the word of God, serving the Lord and your grandchildren, you need to learn to execute 
judgment and righteousness. You know, that means if your kids are out of line and they're disobedient to mom and dad, you've got to execute judgment and righteousness, right? You need to discipline those kids. You know, teach them the word of God. Teach them to do what is right and teach them to obviously not do what is wrong. And, you know, our, our church as well, we need to execute judgment and righteousness. You know, sometimes we may need to carry out church discipline. You know, it's not something that I like to do. It's not something that anybody likes to do. But when people step out of line and, and are harmful to a church and, and, and they're a leaven that's going to leaven the whole lump, you know, the Lord commands us to get rid of that person, you know, to get them out of the church, right? Because we need to be able to act, not just pass judgment, but act righteously. Do what is right for the sake of the church that he may continue, okay? So please consider these things. If you want your family line to continue, you need to execute judgment and righteousness, you know, don't become sloppy, don't become lazy in these areas of your life. Verse number uh, 5. But if you will not hear these words, so now's, now's the opposite, right? I swear by myself, saith the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. So I, I can guarantee, you know, if you want to destroy your family, or if we want to destroy Blessed Up Baptist Church, I can guarantee it, this is how we do it. We don't execute judgment and righteousness. That's it, okay? And God swears to himself. You know how sometimes people say, I swear to God. Well, God says, I swear to myself that if you don't execute judgment and righteousness, you don't do what is right, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring your house to desolation. It's going to be destroyed. I don't want my family destroyed. I don't want your family destroyed. I don't want our church destroyed. So we need to maintain this path of righteousness, maintain this path of judging correctly according to God's word. Verse number six. For thus saith the Lord unto the king's house of Judah, Thou art Gilead unto me, and the head of Lebanon, yet surely I will make thee a wilderness, and cities which are not inhabited. You know, you might say to me, Pastor Kevin, why go through Jeremiah? It's such a negative book. You know, we're not, you know, as a church, it's not like we're struggling. As a church, it seems like we're being blessed. You know, things are going well with the church. We're now to renovate this building. And, you know, we have our faithful members here. and We've had visitors come through. You know, why do we have to always hear these negative sermons? Well, it's important to hear it while things are good. Because we don't want things to get bad. And then we talk about these things. Because you're already on this downward spiral. You want to address these things. Even while things... And look, for me, I look at Blessed Baptist Church, I think things are going so well. That's my opinion. I don't know if you have a different opinion. I think things are, are wonderful. I think that things are going extremely well. And, uh, you know, especially in light of, you know, not having a full-time pastor for a number of years until just recently, I think things are going really well. But we need to hear this while things are going well. So we don't get to a place where things go bad. Okay? And that's what God is saying in verse number 6. Thou art Gilead unto me, the head of Lebanon. He's talking about pleasant things. He's saying, look, you're this beautiful thing to me. Okay? You're these beautiful nations. Then he says, yet surely I will make thee a wilderness and cities which are not inhabited. God's warning them before things get really bad. Okay? He's warning them now. Execute judgment and righteousness before things get bad. Because if you don't do that, it's, it's going down here from there. You're going to bring your house to desolation. Look at verse number 7. I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapon, and they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. The reason cedars are mentioned here is because cedars were uh, in, in Lebanon. You know, cedars are sort of a, a prominent kind of tree. I, I don't know about these days, but especially in the days of the Bible, right? The cedars were known in, in Lebanon. So these were, you know, trees that they would export. It would, it would give them great prosperity, right? And so God is saying, look, I'm going to cut down those cedars. I'm basically going to destroy, you know, uh, you know your prosperity, okay? <coughs> Verse number eight. And many nations shall pass by this city, and they shall say every man to his neighbor, wherefore have the Lord done thus unto this great city? And they shall answer, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshipped other gods and served them. I'm not going to say too much about that. We've obviously seen that as a major theme throughout the book of Jeremiah, that they've turned and worshipped false gods. Okay? And the nations, when they see Judah destroyed, they're going to say to themselves, the reason this happened is because they stopped following their Lord. Okay? Verse number 10. Now, in verse number 10, I want you to pay attention to this because this, again, gives us that historical context. This shows us that we've gone back in time, at least in the, in the, in the books of Jeremiah. Now, before we, we, before we do that, you may ask me, why is it that, you know, we kind of leap around the book of Jeremiah? 
I don't have a full answer to you, okay? But, you know, I've read through the book of Jeremiah a few times as, as I've prepared my sermons. But usually when the Bible is not exactly in chronological order, the reason this happens, of course, is because when Jeremiah was preaching as a prophet, there, were a lot more, there was a lot more that he was preaching than what is collected in the books, okay? Then sometime later, they would take his, his preaching would be taken, the writings would be taken, and then it would be collated into a book, okay? Now, sometimes it's done in chronological order. Some books are not in chronological order in the Bible. And the, usually the reason for this is because instead of it being about, you know, the chronology being the main thing, usually it's more thematic. Usually God is trying to show us, uh, uh, teach us via themes. And one thing that I've noticed, and I don't, I don't have an exact science behind this. I'm not necessarily saying that I'm 100% correct. But one thing I notice in the book of Jeremiah, when I think about the themes, it seems to be uh, three main themes. And, and, and uh, basically, the first theme is the prophecy of the destruction, okay, that's coming to the land. That's why it just seems so negative, you know. And I, I think this probably continues all the way to Jeremiah, about ch chapter 27, roughly, okay. Then from Jeremiah chapter 27 to, I, I can't remember exactly, maybe mid-30s, okay, it's, it's, it's about the restoration, we know that one day these people are going to come back to the land, okay? Not so much these same people, but their descendants. Seventy years later, they're going to come back. And so after God has told them that you're going to be destroyed, God is telling them, hey, but there's hope. You know, there's, prom there's a promise that you are going to return back to the land. Then uh, from that point, about mid-30s to the end of Jeremiah, it's primarily about the destruction occurring. Okay, and then you go to the book of Lamentations and it's Jeremiah weeping about the destruction that took place. So if you kind of look at it like that with the book of Jeremiah, I think it's going to give you a sort of a, a clearer understanding why it's not in chronological order. You know, uh, it's like God just wanted certain themes focused at different times. Okay, so we are going for the worst chapters of Jeremiah, really. Okay, uh, at, at, the, at the beginning of the book. All right. Now, verse number 10. Let's pay attention here. It says, Weep ye, weep, sorry, weep ye not for, a, for the dead. Now, th there is a specific dead person that is being referred to here. I'll, just, I'll show you soon. It says, Neither bemoan, bemoan him, but weep sore for him that goeth away, for he shall return no more, nor see his native country. So there is a king that was to be taken away. In fact, he was taken away into Egypt, and he would not be returned back to the land. So this is the king that's being spoken about. I'll show you who that is soon. It says here, verse number 11, For thus saith the Lord touching Shalem, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. You say, well, another king, Josiah. Who's this Shalem? Okay. Well, if you were here for Thursday, there are some kings, many kings had two names. In fact, on Thursday, we're looking at, uh, in, in the book of 2 Kings, the name of Nebuchadnezzar, and Jeremiah calls him Nebuchadrezzar. It's the same king. King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar is the same king, he has two names, okay? Uh, this is not unusual. We, when we looked at King Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, his, does anyone remember his other name? It was Mataniah, okay? King Mataniah, that's, that's the name he was born with, and then the king of Babylon gave him the name Zedekiah. Many times kings have the same name. What I'm trying to tell you is that Shalom, that's mentioned, is Shalom, the son of Josiah, Shalom is Jehoiakim, okay? It's the same king, okay? And you can see here that Josiah was his father. Now, Josiah, king of Judah, if you don't know, he was a godly king. He was like the last godly, righteous king in Judah. And then Shalom, or Jehoiakim, you know, starts this wicked lineage. So you have, so let me just explain to you who the, who the kings are. The la, these are the last kings of Judah before they're taken into captivity. So you have Josiah, who's a righteous king. Then he has his son, Shalom, who is, we know more as Jehoiakim, Kim, okay? And then he has his son, so he gets uh, taken out of the, pla he, he, uh, well, I'll explain to you soon. Then he has his son, Jehoiakim, with an N instead of an M and a C, okay? Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim only rules for three months. Then we have Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, you know, before the captivity. Okay, so it's Josiah, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, then, uh, actually, no, I'm, I'm missing one. I'm missing one. It's, okay, sorry, I messed this up. I messed this up. I'm sorry, guys. Josiah, last godly king. Then Jehoahaz, uh, Jehoahaz. that's Shalom. Okay, that's Shalom, Jehoahaz. 
This guy is the first uh, wicked king after Josiah. Then Jehoiakim, then Jehoiakin, then Zedekiah, which is Mataniah. Okay? So we'll have a look at this soon because the one that's taken into captivity, oh, sorry, the one that died, okay, uh, is, is, uh, jo uh, sorry, is Josiah, the last godly king. Okay? So if you keep your finger there, and let's go to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 35. 2 Chronicles 35. We have to go through the history because otherwise we don't understand exactly why Jeremiah is preaching these, these things, right? 2 Chronicles 35 verse 23. 2 Chronicles 35 verse 23. Remember, Josiah is the last righteous king. 2 Chronicles 35 verse 23. It says, now Josiah goes to war. I won't explain it all now. But it says, and the archers shot at King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died. So you can see Josiah died here, right, from the, from the, from the battle. And was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. Look at this. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Look at verse number 25. And Jeremiah, so this is the same Jeremiah that we're reading about, right? And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah, and all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah in their lamentations to this day, and made them an ordinance in Israel, and behold, they are written in the lamentations. All right. So the whole nation is sad, because Josiah was a good king. He was a righteous king. And so they're weeping about Josiah that he died in battle. Okay. Now, I hope you kept your finger, now keep your finger there in 2 Chronicles because we are going to come back. But go back to uh, Jeremiah 22, verse number 10. Jeremiah 22, verse number 10. So when it says here, weep ye not for the dead, neither bemoan him. Okay, this is talking about Josiah. God is saying, look, don't weep for Josiah. Yes, he was a good, righteous king. And, you know, why is God saying these things? Well, because Josiah was saved... Okay, and now that he's dead, he's in a better place. He's in heaven. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So when we're dealing with a righteous person, someone that is saved, you know, we sorrow in a different way. Yes, we lost Josiah, a godly king, but we know he's in heaven. So God is saying, look, you don't have to weep for him. It's okay. It's okay with him. In Jeremiah 22, verse 10, it keeps going. It says, but weep. So who are we to weep for? Weep sore for him that goeth away, for he shall return no more, nor see his native country. Okay? And again, in verse 11, it says, for thus saith the Lord touching Shalem. Okay, now. Let's see who Shalem is. You've uh, you're, you're got a finger in 2 Chronicles. Go to 2 Chronicles 36, the next chapter. 2 Chronicles 36, verse number 2. 2 Chronicles. So we're just going to the next chapter where you were before. 2 Chronicles 36. So we know that Josiah dies. So who's going to take over the kingdom now? Well, traditionally, it's the son. Okay, the one that... And you look at verse number 2. It says, Jehoahaz, that's Shalem. Okay, that's mentioned in Jeremiah 20. I hope this is making sense for you guys. Jehoahaz was 20 and 3 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 3 months in Jerusalem. So only 3 months. And the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned the land in an hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem and turned his name to Jehoiakim. So Jehoiakim's other name is Eliakim. Okay, you can see how these kings have two names. This is why it's confusing sometimes when you're reading these things. You need to remember who, which king is which, right? And uh, Nico took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. So Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, he gets taken away into the land of Egypt. Okay? Okay, now, go back to Jeremiah 22, verse number 10 again. Jeremiah 22, verse number 10. So weep not for the dead, neither bemoan him, is Josiah. He was a righteous king. But weep sore for him that goeth away, 
That's Shalom, or uh, also, uh, what was his name? Jehoahaz, all right? Uh, For he shall return no more, nor see his native country, because he was taken away into Egypt. All right. So why are they called to weep for him? Well, because here would be, you know, they've lost the righteous king. You know, and so, so these kings are being used symbolically about the nation. This nation was once a righteous nation, okay? But now this nation is being represented by Shalom or, or uh, Jehoahaz, okay? Which was carried away individually into Egypt. And so he symbolically represents the nation of Judah. That they too would be carried away into captivity, not into Egypt, but into Babylon, okay? And so God is saying, look, weep for him because he represents what's going to happen to you. You know, you've lost your last righteous king and now you've got these wicked kings and, you know, your destruction is near. And so God is, again, telling these kings, you know, listen, execute righteous, righteousness and judgment, okay? So you continue, get things back right like it was with Josiah, you know, otherwise your future will be to be carried away just like that king was. I hope that makes sense. Okay. All right, now, verse number 13. You don't need to keep a finger in, in Second Chronicles anymore. Jeremiah 22, verse number 13. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. Hey, what are we called to build our house with? Righteousness, okay? But woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong that useth his neighbor's service without wages and giveth him not his work. So we have some examples here of building your house with unrighteousness. You know, this king built his house. He tried to, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, extend his palace. He tried to have a bigger house. But when he got the laborers to come in, he did not pay them. He says that use of his neighbor's service without wages and give him not for his work. So one unrighteous way that you can act is you get someone to do a job for you. You agree on a price. They do the job and you don't pay them. Or you pay them under the amount of what was agreed. That is an act of unrighteousness. I hope you're not like that. And I hope you're not a haggler. Once you agree on a price and the job gets done, just pay them what you agreed. Okay, don't... People are like that, though. I mean, in your industry, Brother Rams, I'm sure it's like that. I'm sure that there are agreements between builders and contractors. They make agreements, the job gets done or whatever. It's like, oh, you know, no, we're not going to pay you that much for whatever reason. No, no, that's that's unrighteousness. Okay? And and that's what, you know, this king was doing. Because look at verse number 14. It says, That saith... I will build me a wide house and large chambers. He wanted a big house, Jehoiakim. And cut of him out, cut of him out windows. And it is sealed with, with cedar and painted with vermilion. I don't know what all that is, but I'm assuming, you know, well, we know what cedar is, but I'm assuming this is a very luxurious, you know, a house, a very big mansion that is being built for himself. So he's kind of boasting about how big his house is. And then he says in verse number 15, Shalt thou reign? Because thou closest thyself in cedar? God is asking a question. Do you think you're going to continue reigning because of your house? Like, is this what you have on show? Is this what makes you think you can reign over Israel because you've got a big house? Okay. Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. Let's bring that Josiah. You know, did not your father... Now, Josiah is the grandfather. This is where I got confused, right? Sometimes the Bible, even, even if it's a grandfather, sometimes the Bible just refers to you as a father or, or as the son of that person. But it's the, it's the grandfather, the grandson. And so about Josiah here. Did Josiah not eat and drink? Did, was, was Josiah not what uh, was not um, blessed? And did he not reign for a long time? Why? Because he did judgment and justice, okay? And it was well with him. So if you want things to be well with you, you ought to act out of judgment and justice. It's the same kind of idea of what we saw, judgment and righteousness. Do that which is right. King Josiah reigned and had power and, and had influence and was able to serve God because he was just a, a, a king of judgment and justice. Whereas Jehoiakim here thinks, if I just make everything look grand and, and amazing and I build big palaces, people are going to think of me as this great king. Listen, what you have, what your possessions have, show, doesn't show you how good you are with the Lord. Okay? It's your character, it's your judgment, it's your justice, it's your righteousness, which shows you to be a good person before the Lord. He's going to bless you from that. He's not going to bless you out of what your exterior possessions look like or how big your house looks like. Okay? That does not necessarily make you right with God. This ungodly king was able to build himself a wonderful house, but he was not right with God. Okay? Verse number 16. 
he judged, speaking about Josiah, he judged the cause of the poor and needy. So King Josiah, he cared about those that, were, that had needs, right? And it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? But thine eyes and thine hearts are not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. So Jehoiakim was a covetous, violent king, according to God. He's nothing like his grandfather, Josiah. Okay? And I, I love in verse number 16, sorry, I kind of skipped it. It says, was not this to know me? Josiah wanted to know God. He says, look, I'm, I'm going to act out of judgment. I'm going to do what's righteous. I'm going I'm to carry out justice because I want to know more about God. You see, the more judgment, uh, the more you judge correctly, the more you walk in righteousness, the more you're going to know God. Amen. If you walk in the ways of unrighteousness, you aren't going to know God. Okay, when you walk in the paths of unrighteousness, you're going to be the covetous person. You're going to be the violent person toward others. You're not going to care about the, the causes of the needy okay, when you walk in unrighteousness. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 21, 26, He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. The righteous giveth and spareth not. You know, we're called to be hospitable. We're called to give. You know, um, it, it's, I've, I've said this before, but, you know, especially up on, on the Sunshine Coast, we lived in a really tight, small house. And it was very hard for me to be hospitable to people, like to have them at our house. We've got to be more room in our house here, so we have people over more often, you know. But, you know, one thing that I, I just like, if I can't have them over to my house, you know, I'm going to try to take people out sometimes, you know. And I, sometimes I invite people out for just a chat, you know, for a coffee or a, or a lunch. And I, I'm, I always want to, for some reason, I always want to pay. But I'm like, no, I, I'm, I'm paying. This is my way of showing hospi hospitality, right? I mean, we live in a nation where we're not really, we're, we're not, you know, with people that are needy. We all kind of have, you know, and it's, it's not like how little do we have, it's like how much do we have. Some people have more, some people have less, but we all have in Australia. You know, we're still blessed in this nation. But, you know, we're called to be hospitable toward people, you know, to, to welcome people, to love people. And, uh, you know, that, that is the path of righteousness. You know, some people think that, you know, I, well, I don't want to give of my possessions, of myself, of my financial, because I've got to keep it for myself. That's covetousness. That's, the, that's a way of unright. You think you're going to get rich just by keeping it to yourself, but it's not. If you show hospitality, if you give of what you have in abundance to others, God will bless you. Amen. Okay, God will bless you. God will give you back more than what you've given. You know, this is a, you know, a guarantee from the Lord. Now, verse number 18. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Don't forget Josiah is the grandfather. Okay, and so Jehoiakim is the grandson of Josiah. <coughs> they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or ah, sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or ah, his glory. So when Jehoiakim is gone, they're not to weep over him. They're not to say, Oh, man, the days of Jehoiakim were so great. You look at his palace. Look, look, no. You know, God is telling the people of the land, don't even, you know, mourn for him. Don't lament for him, because he was a wicked king. You know, we should not lament for wicked people. Amen. We should not lament for wicked people. You know, uh, sometimes when people pass away, movie stars, you know, so many movie stars are just filth. They're like the scum of the earth. They're so wicked. But often when a, when a Hollywood star passes away, it's on the news. You know, uh, did you know this person passed away? And then they have like a montage of his great movies and his great life and he, all this stuff. It's like, no, you know, the world laments for the wicked. You know, we're not called to be that way. You know, we're not called to, to lament or weep for those that are wicked. Proverbs 10 verse 7 says, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. The name of the just, the memory of the just is blessed. It's good to remember people that have passed on that were righteous, that were godly. You know, maybe people that have given you the, the gospel or families that were saved, people, it's good to keep them in memory. Okay? Uh, but listen, when it comes to the wicked, don't lament for the wicked. Don't be upset that your favorite you know, musician passes away or something like that. Because maybe you used to love their music when you were a child or something, and you've got those, you know, those attachments, and you hear the music, and it kind of brings you some level of joy. But I'm telling you, a lot of these, you know, you, you know this. I don't have to tell you. You know these celebrities are scum. You know they live wicked, awful, sinful lives. You know they're full of covetousness. You know, many of them claim they've sold their soul to the devil. 
Okay, I mean, they're just wicked people, but quite often, you know, you just hear this stuff, oh, I can't believe this musician passed away. I can't believe this movie star passed away. Who cares? They're wicked people. Don't lament for them. Don't have a memory for them. Verse number 20. Go up to Lebanon and cry and lift up thy voice in Bashan and cry from the passages for all thy lovers are destroyed. So God is telling Judah, hey, go and look at Lebanon. Lebanon is called one of your lovers, okay? So Lebanon is, is, a, is a nation that Judah had, you know, made friendships with, basically, right? I mean, they've taken the, the, the trees, the cedars, right? That's how Jehoiakim built his palace, right? And what happened to Lebanon is that they've been destroyed, okay? He said, look, go to Lebanon, have a look how they've been destroyed. They've been destroyed by the Babylonians, if you know your history, okay? So they've done that before they destroyed Judah. And God is saying, look at what, you know, what's happened to your lovers. The same thing is going to happen to you. You know, cry about that. Okay? Lift up your voice. Verse number 21. I spake unto thee in thy prosperity, but thou saidest, I will not hear. This have been thy manner from thy youth, that thou obeyest not my voice. The wind shall eat up all thy pastors, and thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then shalt thou be ashamed and confounded for all thy wickedness. So it's here, it's speaking once again of the judgment to come. And God is saying, look, I've warned you about this for a long time. Okay, for a long time. It's not like you've just gotten bad and now I'm warning you. You know, I've already kind of said about, I, I said, I, I talked about this just before. I said, the reason we need to hear sermons like this, we need to hear it while things are good. So they don't go bad. In verse number 21, God says, I spake unto thee in thy prosperity. God said, I've been telling you about this judgment. I've been warning you not to turn your back against God, even when things were well with you, even when you were prosperous. But thou saidest, I will not hear. So, you know, you may listen to negative preaching sometimes, and you say, well, things are going well. You know, ah, Pastor Kevin, can't believe he's preaching this again. Jeremiah, I will not hear. It's not relevant to us now. That's a dangerous place to be. Take the warnings now. Yeah. While we are prosperous, we're still, we still have freedoms in this, play, in this world. Still, things are still going well. Okay? I'm still hopeful for the future. All right? But we need to hear it now. Okay? And, and, God's, and that's the thing. When we're prosperous, when we're blessed, and we have everything we need, that's often when we turn our, our ears away from the Lord. We stop hearing the warnings because things are going so well. But we need to keep hearing sermons against sin, sermons against wickedness, sermons against unrighteousness, so we don't end up that way. Amen. Verse number 23. O inhabitants of Lebanon, that makest thy nest in the cedars, how gracious shalt thou be when pangs come upon thee, the pain of a woman in travail. All right. Now, when it says, O oh, inhabitants of Lebanon, I'm not sure if God is speaking specifically to those that lived in Lebanon, because they've already been destroyed by the Babylonians. Or if God is calling the people of Judah inhabitants of Lebanon, because they've made agreements with wicked nations, they brought in the, the gods of wicked nations, and so maybe God is sarcast sarcastically maybe calling those of Judah inhabitants of Lebanon, potentially. But the point is this. The point is uh, where it says that pangs shall come upon thee, the pain of a woman in travail. So, I've told you guys before, as we're going through Jeremiah, you're going to notice this constantly being brought up. Brought up. A woman, the birth pains of a woman, right? The, the labor pains of a woman. And every time so far, what is it about? It's about the coming judgment of the Babylonians. Every time so far, okay? You say, why do you keep telling us this? We'll get to it eventually, I promise. But I won't tell you now, because otherwise, it'll just take us down a long rabbit hole. But I just want to show you, a rabbit trail. I just want to show you that every time, and this is a constant thing, the woman in travail, the pangs, it's always about the Babylonian captivity. I'll give you a sneak peek why I keep bringing this up. Because some people take this at some point and they'll say, well, that's about the future. That's about the Jews in the future. No, it's about the past. It's about the Babylonian judgment, okay? I mean, I don't know how God can make this any clearer, just over and over and over again, about these labor pains of a woman tying into the coming judgment of Babylon. Verse number 24. As I live, saith the Lord, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, now let me just stop there. Who, does anyone remember who the son of Jehoiakim was? We looked at it on Thursday. Or even, I mentioned it even today. Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin. Yeah, chin. But yeah, this H, H is silent. So Jehoiakim. Okay. But this is his other name, Kaniah. So again, most of these kings have 
multiple names. So you've got to remember this as we keep going, okay? So this is about Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiakim, okay? Same, his, Kenai is the same guy. All right, let's go again. As I live, saith the Lord, though Kenai, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were, were the singlet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence. All right, so Jehoiakim would only rule for three months. God is saying, look, even though you have the signet, even, maybe it's a ring or something, even though you have something that says that you're the king of Judah, I'm going to take that away. I'm going to pluck that out away from you. So he only rules for, for three months. Anyway, verse number 25. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. So you may remember on Thursday we looked at this king got carried away into captivity as long as with his wives, with his mother, and with other great men that were in his kingdom that were taken into captivity. So this is, again, we've gone back in time from Jeremiah 21, and Jeremiah is prophesying about what judgment is going to fall upon these kings. Verse number 26, And I will cast thee out, and thy mother that bare thee, in another country, where ye were not born, and there shall ye die. Again, that was, the, the, that was Babylon. But to the land whereunto they desire to return, thither shall they not return. But this man, Coniah, is a despised, broken idol. Notice the next words. He is a vessel wherein is no pleasure. God is saying, Coniah or Jehoiakim is a vessel that I have no pleasure in. I have, I, I'm not pleased by him at all. Okay, Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed and are cast into a land which they know not. So notice um, Coniah or Jehoiakim, his seed will no longer continue. Okay, it will, be, it will be cast out. I started by saying that this is a chapter that teaches us how to have a long lineage, how to ensure that our house continues over the next generations to come. Okay, so you can see here that we need to be people that please the Lord. We need to be a vessel that God is honored with, okay? Not a vessel of dishonor. And then in verse number 29, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. So again, it's not just about the kings. This is for every inhabitant of the earth to pay attention to. Verse number 30, Thus saith the Lord, Write ye, this man childless, okay, Je Jehoiakim, he's childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Now, we're going to end on 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's please turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. So King Coniah or King Jehoiakim would not have, his, would not have children. Okay? He would not continue a, a lineage because he was a vessel that, did not have any, that gave no pleasure to God. So what will give pleasure to God if God looks at us as vessels? What's a vessel? Maybe like a cup, something that he can use, that he can drink from, right? Maybe a, a bucket or something like that, right? God looks at us as vessels and he wants to look at us and, and say, well, I, I want to find pleasure in this person, okay? And how do we do it again? Well, we need to execute judgment and righteousness, okay? Now let's end here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth true, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Brethren, do you name the name of Christ? God wants you to depart from iniquity. Okay? Stop walking in your unrighteous ways. You need to clean up your life. Don't get comfortable where you are. You still have sin. So do I. We still sin. Okay? And we need to live a life that continues to clean up that iniquity. Verse number 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. God is using this illustration now. Okay? In a house, maybe in your house, maybe you have some cups that you only take out when you invite your guests. Maybe they're your more precious cups. Maybe gold or silver, I don't know. Maybe you've got silver. Some people have silver uh, knives and forks and stuff like that, you know. Uh, and they don't use that in a normal household, but they use it when special guests are over. Maybe some of you have that, you know. You have some things that give you honor and some that are, that are more dishonorable. But God uses it to describe us, okay? Like he did with the king in Jeremiah 22. Verse number 21. 
If any man purge, therefore purge himself from these, from what? From the iniquity, right? He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Do you want to be a vessel unto honor or a vessel unto dishonor? Do you want God to be pleased when he looks at you? Or do you want him to be displeased? Okay, obviously we want God to be pleased. We want God to find honor when he uses our vessels. Okay, that's our bodies. God wants to use us to do his work. God promises a long lineage to us. God promises that our house will continue, that our children will continue being great people and serving the Lord, and blessed up will continue serving the Lord, you know, for the coming generations. But we must execute judgment and righteousness. Okay, we must clean up our lives. We need to get the sin, the iniquity out of our lives so God can pick us up like a cup one day and we can shine like these gold and silver vessels that bring God honor. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, 